presence in this place this morning. We thank you for this gift of worship, for the ability to praise you. God, we thank you for who you are, for what you're going to do today, that your glory will be shown in this place, that things will happen that only you can do. We love you and we praise you. All right, good to see everybody this week. I missed y'all last week, and uh, glad to be back. And uh, I'm going to bring a message here in a moment, just a couple things uh, to remind. I know Nikki had mentioned some of these, but if you're planning on participating next week uh, for the uh, community outreach, let me know, because so, we're putting together projects. If you know of somebody that needs some work, like, you know, a widow lady or some elderly people that can use some work, let us know so we can go ahead and set these projects up. But uh, if you're planning on participating, please let me know. Uh, and uh, so we'll have enough projects or we won't have too many projects. But uh, anyway, uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, something we've done in the past years, and it's, 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 it's awesome to go out and be the hands and feet of Christ. Amen? It's awesome just go out and as a group and corporately go out and help people out, and it's awesome. Great crowd this morning. I'm really encouraged by all of you being here, and uh, we are gonna, I'm going to bring a message. I'm going to continue what uh, Ticot, my son-in-law, spoke on last week on worship. And so uh, I'm so thankful. Uh, great job, T. Cott, on doing the message last week. Amen. And uh, um, I'm going to bring a different angle to it, but uh, something I want to teach us on, and it's going to lead into our communion service, which we're going to have at the end of the service. And then, uh, uh, so we're, that's kind of the order of what is going to happen. But, you know, we're, talk, we're talking about worship again today. And, uh, you know, what does it mean to really worship? And T. Cott was talking about uh, how that uh, uh, we... Uh, uh, Worship from our heart, not just through our voices and stuff like that. It's mainly our heart condition, and you know, it's we worship Him because of what He's done for us, and He's on, uh, worthy and honor of being uh, worshipped in that way. And what I want to do today is I want to go back to the beginning of time, uh, because uh, from the beginning of time, and let you see how this has revolved and how God has brought worship, and then uh, how it really affects our lives today as well. Now, what is worship really? What is worship? I mean, when you worship something. It's, it depends on you, re, you recognize the value of its worth. When you, when you worship someone, then you recognize the value of that person's worth. And it's amazing how that, you know, worship has gone on from, from the very beginning of time. I mean, in the very beginning of time, what happened is the people knew that there was a God or gods out there. They just didn't know who they were and where they are and, and, uh, and how to really connect to them. But they knew that somebody had control of everything in this world. Somebody was in charge. Somebody was up there and, and, and you know, was, was calling the shots and, and knew uh, what was going to happen. And so the early days was the ancient uh, worship, the ancient worship where they just worshipped a bunch of different gods. There wasn't just one god. It was a bunch of gods. And they, they really looked up to the gods. They really they, they valued them. They recognized them. Why? Because they depended on these gods. In their mind in the early days, they thought that, you know, that, that the rain came because of the gods, you know, which brought them crops, and that was because of the, you know, the gods. And, you know, if it showed favor towards their children, it was because of the gods. And so they worshipped these gods in a way that they thought would show favor to them. And not only that, when they, the early ancient age, when they would worship the gods, they would, uh, you know, they, they, would, they would have to bribe the gods. They believed in a sacrificial system. There was, they come up with a system where they would shed the blood of animals uh, and, and try to bribe the, the gods in order to get favor and blessings shown on them. And so what they would do is they would sacrifice, you know, they, they thought that the value of the blood that they were sacrificing would determine, you know, how much God would show them favor. Now, this was their, their way of thinking. So in the early days, there's a lot of gods. They're, 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 they're trying to bribe God to get their way. And sometimes they would sacrifice the enemies. You know, uh, They also worshiped the gods because whenever they were battling for land and territories and things like this, they believed that when you shed blood and you made a sacrifice to the gods, they would give you victory in war. And so here we are now. They're, they're worshiping these gods in a way they really don't know who these gods are. And they know they're out there, and they're trying to make a connection and try to figure out how can we get favor of the gods. And they thought, you know, if I, sh if I, if I kill an enemy and shed their blood, then God would show favor. 
And it depended on how valuable the blood was and how much it meant to that person as to how much favor they would get. I know this is a ridiculous way, and it's sad to say that some people even view God in this way now. But then, back in this ancient time, what they would do is they're worshiping. Sometimes if they really needed help and really needed something, sometimes they would sacrifice people from their own tribe. And if they really wanted to hear from God, they would even sacrifice children, and sometimes even their very own children, because they thought they would have to bribe the gods to get what they needed. And this was the whole thought press process in the, in the early days, in the beginning of time. So worship uh, for the ancient people revolved around the idea of sacrifice. And they somehow tied in that the pouring out of blood showed more favor on God. And so this is kind of what the early, early people were thinking. So they wanted to keep the gods happy. So the ancient worship, here they are going through this. They're thinking, if I want to have favor from God, if I want it to rain on my crops, if I want to win this victory, if I want to have favor on my family, then I've got to do these things to keep the, the gods happy. But it was like they were, it was kind of tricky. They were trying to figure out exactly what, you know, what is going to make, what's going to show them more favor. And they're trying to figure out, you know, how to get this favor of God. And, and they really didn't quite under, understand it. And then some, uh, some religious people would come on the scene, some holy men. And they would start taking advantage of the system in the early days because they were telling people that, hey, we've got connection with the gods. And if you'll uh, listen to what we're telling you to do, then, then the gods are going to show you favor. So they started leaning on some of these religious people, you know, and these people that would speak. And they would even interpret, you know, the things so it worked in their favor. And so you had this kind of thing going on where it was being manipulated and being abused and, and all these kind of things. And so uh, it, it seemed to always go back to where the person that was manipulating, you know, they were always getting something out of it. And so uh, that, this kind of thing was going on in the, early, in the early ancient times. And then we move on to the next, next section is the ancient Jewish worship. All right? The ancient Jewish worship. Now God has chosen a country... He has showed favor to some people, and he's going to do something in this nation, and he wants them to to follow him, and he's got something that he's up to, and that's the nation of Israel. So now what we've got here is, is, is God has come on the scene, and through Moses, he gives the nation of Israel all these things for them to follow and to do, and he says, you can go ahead and sacrifice animals, but you can't sacrifice human beings anymore. You can sacrifice animals and bring them to the altar and ask for forgiveness of sin. You can do that. Now, this is the nation of Israel I'm talking about. The nation of Israel who he had chose. He said, but not only that, you know, I want you to... The sacrificial part of it is not the most important part anymore. The most important part, nation of Israel, Jews, the Jewish, the Hebrew, we want you to obey what I tell you to do. And he created a covenant. And you can go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, and that kind of lays out the, the covenant that God has given to the nation of Israel. And God has got a plan. Because, see, you've got the ancient Jew uh, worship. They've got all these kind of gods, the pagan gods. They're not real. They're, they're false. They were, didn't have any hope. And now he's coming in. They're still having to make sacrifices. So now when they sin, they have to make a sacrifice, shed the blood, take it to the, or take it to the altar, shed, have the blood shed, and that give them forgi- you know, atonement for sins. Atonement. It covered the sins. In other words, it didn't, you know, they were forgiven for it, but really it was a thing of atonement where it was just covered up. And so this is kind of what's going on here. But go read Deuteronomy chapter 28 and, and look at that for yourself. That can be your Bible reading this week and your study. But he says, God says in the covenant, I'm going to give you this land, the promised land, Now, when God says he's going to do something for you, he's going to do it, okay? That's the hard part. The nation of Israel, they were believing God, then they stopped believing God, and they believed God, and they stopped showing God's favor, and they go back and forth. God said in the Scriptures, I'm going to give you this land. I don't care who's there, what's there. I'm giving you this land, and I'm going to be with you, but I want you to stay inside the covenant that I have gotten for you because what's going to happen in this covenant is that people are going to learn how to worship the one true God, Okay? the one true God. There's no longer going to be a bunch of different gods. It's going to be one true God, and that is the, the, the Yahweh, the, the, the one true God that we worship today. So the nation of Israel is so important. And he says this. He says, now listen, I love you. You're my people. I have chosen you, and I will always love you. But if you disobey, I'm going to kick you out of the country. I'm not going to let you keep it. I'm going to kick you out. It's kind of like us parents, whenever you put your kid in time out, you know, you go sit over there until you can learn to act right with the family, then you can come back. 
And if you'll notice reading through the Old Testament, when you watch the nation of Israel, they're, man, they're, they're on, they're off, they're on, they're off, they're, they're, they're everywhere, kind of like some of us are today with our Christian walk. We're, we're fired up, and then we, then, we, then we start losing our faith, then we start gaining our faith, then we start losing our faith, and we're back and forth. And he says, listen, I'm already going to give you this land. I just want you to do these things. And inside the covenant, he says, this is how I want you to treat each other. I want you to love one another. I want you to take care of one another. I want you to, to not, not do these horrible things to your own, your, own, your own people. I want you to behave in this manner. And he, and he writes it out how he's supposed to do it. But not only that, he, he shows them how to treat foreigners in this covenant that he writes with Israel. He also shows them uh, how to treat their servants. And again, he forbid them to now kill any kind of children as a sacrifice. That was off the table. That was no longer going to happen. Now, when this covenant came out with God and came through Moses... The world had never seen anything like this before. It was always the gods. It was always you know, these things that they were doing. It was never just a one God, and now all of a sudden some things are starting to change. And so everybody's like, I don't know, you know what's up with this, what's up with this? But God says this, and, and it was just fabulous how that he did this whole covenant with the nation of Israel. Because not only he's going to teach the, the, the Israelites, the Jews, how to act, but also those other people, you're going to start bringing them in now serving the one true God. So, and this is going to point even towards the future. His whole plan with Israel was to the one that was going to be coming one day. So now we're in Jewish worship. They're worshiping the one true God. They're going to the temple. Every time they sin, they have to sacrifice an animal. And they sacrifice that animal in order to be forgiven of that sin. Every single time. Can you imagine every time you and I sin, having to go get an animal and whatever one it was in the, you know, you were supposed to do and take it to the altar and the high priest and they would sacrifice the animal every single time. This is what this nation had to do. And so now everything had changed the way that the original people, the ancient, uh, the ancient uh, worship was. Israel's God was more concerned about obedience than sacrifice. So things are changing now. And then the ancient Hebrew king Solomon said this in Proverbs 21.3. So he's already figured some of this out too, but Proverbs 21.3, to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. He says to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. In other words, the obedience is your best way of worshiping now. Obedience, doing what I tell you to do is the worship that I want to have from you. I've got a plan, I've got, I'm up to something, but it's so important that the whole world sees you as different. They see you as different. And this is the way it was. Now, this is in the Old Testament, in case you're not real familiar with the Bible. The Old Testament is before Christ comes, and, and the, the New Testament is when Christ is here and lives and dies, and, and, and then all the writers write about Jesus. But it's, it's two time periods. So in the Old Testament is the, is the covenant that, that they made with Moses and the uh, uh, the nation of Israel, but it's all pointing to Jesus. By the way, the whole Bible points to Jesus, amen? It's all about Jesus. Everything is pointing towards Jesus and what, he's, what is getting ready to come. So because Israel didn't believe in all the gods, they just believed in the one God, the world is saying, what in the world is going on now? This is just crazy. We've never seen anything like this. And so Israel's sacrifice, sacrificial system was designed to make atonement for sin. And the atonement, if you look at the word atonement, at one meant. You can kind of figure out what it's going to mean. What it, what it is is it's a reconciliation. It is a bringing two parties together. It, it is reconciling is what that word atonement means. And of course, as, as you know, our sin against God separates us from God. And so now this whole plan that, that God is working up uh, that is going to eventually come is going to be, is going to be reconciling us back to God. But the atonement, the word atonement means making reconciliations. It's to cover up something. That was the Hebrew word for it, is to cover something, cover the sins. Not take them away, it was just to cover the sin. Now, this is still the nation of Israel and what they're going through. But it was to cover something bad, this was their thought, with something good in order to restore a relationship. So it's reconciliation, covering something bad with something good. So this was kind of the Jewish worship during the time. It wasn't a bribe like the old ancient was. There was no bribe. God says, All right, you're my people. I love you, and I'm with you. But you know, if you don't act right, I'm going to kick you out of the land I'm going to give you. But other than that, you just obey and do what I tell you to do, and uh, we're going to move with this plan. So day after day, the individual Hebrews, the Jews, would have to come and make sacrifices as they would sin. That's on a daily basis. But then something really, something's going to change. Now the Day of Atonement is going to happen. 
the Day of Atonement with the nation of Israel. And what that means is, is once a year, the whole nation of Israel would come together and ask for forgiveness of sin for their whole nation. Not the personal sins, because they're doing that on a daily basis. But on a annual, uh, every year, they would come together and they would come into the temple. They would get as close as they could, and they would all ask for forgiveness for their nation and so that their nation could be forgiven of their sin as a nation for one whole year. And then after that year was up, they would all come back and they would do it again. The Day of Atonement is what it's called. The Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. They would do that once a year. That was once a year. They would come back and as a nation ask for forgiveness. But anyway, their personal sins is on a daily basis. The the nation's sins were on a Day of Atonement. But as part of the celebration of this festival, and I mentioned this, I think, uh, a couple of months ago, but I'll mention it again. The, the, the thing that they would do when they got to the temple and everybody come, and as a nation, what they would do is the high priest would put his hands on, on the goat, the sacrifice, and he'd put his hands on the goat, and it was symbolic of putting all the nation's sins into this goat. And then what they would do is they would take this goat out of the city, out into the wilderness far away, and abandon it, leaving it out there. And that was symbolic of the nation's sins had been forgiven. They had been taken away. They had been moved away. And that was at the Day of Atonement. But it, this, this, this whole idea of forgiveness of sins, it was an atonement. It was a covering up. So ancient Jewish worship was a temporary fix, this is in your outline, for a problem that required an ultimate solution. But Jewish worship is going to be pointing towards the Messiah. In other words, this whole setup of Israel is going to be pointing up, getting the, the whole plan laid out for Jesus to come one day as the Messiah and to give his life. God chose this nation on purpose, Israel. They had a plan through this nation to bring the Savior of the world. And so we have to realize that, that now obedience is the most important thing for the nation of Israel. If you offended someone, the Israelites, then they had to go and make restitution. They had to go make it right for them. They had to go take care of it. And then something extraordinary is going to happen. The Bible says a man came out of the wilderness. A man came out of the wilderness, like out of nowhere, but Matthew said wilderness, and he was a man that was different. He was a man that God had ordained to come to these people and to do a specific job. He was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He was going to come and he was going to lay out the groundwork before the Messiah was to come. This is a type of man. He was, he was gritty. He was tough. He, was, he wasn't shy. He was, he was a strong man. And he was now, he had come on the scene and his name was John the Baptist. Not somebody you'd probably want to invite to your dinner table. But anyway, he was a, a guy that, you know, that God had called to come and lay the groundwork. And now John the Baptist, he come down to the Jordan Valley and down to the Jordan River. And he's down there. Now, if, if you had a name John, you had to have a last name too because there was so many Johns. And so John the Baptist, he got his name because he went to a Presbyterian church. And then he went to a Methodist church. And then he joined the Baptist church. That's how he got his that's not true. Some of you are going, is that really true? No, that's not true. All right. Just want to make sure you're still with me. All right. But anyway, um, John the Baptist, he's down in the river and he's baptizing and he's a, you know, and what is he baptizing in? And they're like, what is he doing? They've never seen this before. And he says, look, God is up to something in our world and there's going to be a big change. The whole plan is going to be changing and you better repent of your sins and you better get things right and you better be ready because if you're not, you're going to be in trouble. So John the Baptist is down here telling people, look, there is one coming. There is one coming that you and I need to identify ourselves with. And when I baptize you, that identifies you with the one that's coming and the plan that God is up to. And so this is what John the Baptist was doing down in the river. And there was a lot of people, they were skeptical. You know, they'd never seen anything like this. I mean, they had seen Gentiles go through a ceremony. Now, in case you're new to church, let me just make sure the Jewish people were God's chosen people. But now, all of a sudden, Gentiles could start you know, being transformed, they could, they could switch over to the Jews. Gentiles were another nation, but now some of the Gentiles are saying, hey, I want to worship that one true God. In order to do that, you had to go through a ceremony. You had to go through a meal and go through a cleansing, and sometimes you were, you were baptized in that whole process. So they'd seen it in the Gentiles, but not the Jews. Why have we got to be baptized? Hey, we're from the family of Abraham. I mean, we're God's chosen one. Why would we have to do this? And John says a new order is coming to town. There's a new order coming to the earth. And you need to be baptized and realizing that, hey, I'm going to, for the repentance of your sins, because of the one that's coming, you need to identify yourself with that one. 
And so he's down there doing this. And then you got your temple leaders who are, you know, they were, they were not in favor of what was going on here, but they wanted to go check it out. So they go down there and they say, hey, they get close to John and they say, hey, are you the Messiah? John says, oh, no, I'm not the Messiah. When the one comes, I won't even be able to, I'm not even worthy to stand in his presence. You know, I can't even, I, I want, I'm not even worthy to be his servant. I'm not even worthy enough to, 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 to latch his sandals. No, I'm not even worthy. When he comes, you'll know who he is, but I'm not that one. And then the Sadducees and the, and the Pharisees, these were the, your really religious leaders. And these were the people that, that uh, they were probably most honored as far as the, you know, the people that were in control. And so now they want to come in on it. And so they start moving their way down to see what John is talking about. And they get down real close. And I, they, they could see on John's face they, they had made a mistake. <laughs> John didn't play. And John sees the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those religious leaders that like to manipulate the system and make their own rules and do their own thing. Now all of a sudden, they're coming down to check it out. John sees them and he says, you brood of vipers. He didn't hold back, did he? He didn't play. They got to like John. But anyway, he was like, you know, he knew the risk. These were the honorable men. You know, they could have done something to him. But he wasn't going to worry about it. He said, look. You brood of vipers, you have no idea what's getting ready to happen. Unless you repent, unless you get baptized, identifying yourself with, G, with the one that's going to come, then, then you're going to be in trouble. So you need, to get this, you need to get this done, and you better listen to what I am, am saying. And so he's down in the Jordan River, and he's saying, Are you ready to repent of your sin and be cleansed of your sin? And are you ready to identify with this brand of new thing that God is about to do in the midst and some of these people had never seen anything like this. There were tens of thousands of people that came down to the Jordan River. There were so many people. Everybody was coming. The scene was set. They were wanting to know. They, were, they really admired or was really uh, intrigued by what John was teaching. It was different. And they're thinking, wow, is this something of God? And so you've got people sitting on the banks of the river listening to what's going on. And then when God had everything in order, everything where, where he wanted it in place, one afternoon, one afternoon, one of the most dramatic events happened. And John the Baptist is down in the Jordan River, and he looks up above the crowd, up on the hill, and he tells everybody, he says, look. And he points towards him. John, in verse John 1, he says, look, at last, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God, the one that you know is supposed to be coming. You know the Messiah was coming, and that is he right there. Look. That is the Lamb of God. He is from God, and he is a gift from God. There he is, who has come to take upon himself and carry away once and for all, not the sins of our nation like they had been doing. He said once and for all, once and for all the sin of the world. You see, the ultimate solution had come for the, for the ultimate problem, and that is Jesus Christ. He said, look, the final sacrifice for your sin Hebrews, we don't know who the author that was, but look at this. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1, the law is only a shadow. The law was what the nation of Israel was under. The law was only a shadow of, a good, of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, you can never, by the same sacrifices, repeat endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. It's not enough anymore. It's not enough. Then look at verse 3. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of the bulls and goats to take away the sins. Can it cover them? Yes. Can it cover them temporarily? Yes. But can it take them away? No. What they were doing before in this sacrificial system under the Jewish worship, they no longer, that would no longer work. And until John said, look, the Lamb of God who has come to take upon himself and carry away once and for all the sin of of this world. You see, Jesus came to replace the old covenant. He came to, to fulfill the, 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 the prophecy from the past. You see, Jesus came with God's plan in mind. He came on the scene so that the sin of the world could now be taken away, not just covered, but it will be taken away. Sin would no longer be atoned for. God was sacrificed on behalf of the human race. And again, for thousands of years, humans. They were worshiping these gods, 
trying to show favor and trying to bribe them. And for hundreds of years now, the nation of Israel had, had tried to, 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 to do the sacrificial thing through going to the temple and trying to do all this and all this taking place. But, in, but this God, who's not going to demand anything from us, what he's going to do is he's going to give us something through Jesus Christ. Amen? He's going to give us peace, reconciliation back to him. And he's going to give us a relationship back. And in the course of one afternoon, Jesus died on that cross, and then God raised him from the dead. And now worship has changed forever. Worship now is not to the pagan gods. It's not just to the one true God that you went to the, to the sacrifice, the animal's blood, so that your sins could be forgiven. Now we've got somebody who now your sins are washed away altogether because of what he did out of love for you and I. That's Christian worship. Now we've got Christian worship. This is what he has set up. And I want to give you three things real quick about Christian worship. And then we're going to partake in communion. And then we're going to have another song at the end. Here's the thing. What Christ did for us when we take communion. See, communion has all three of these. It has all three of these. We do this to remember what he's done for us. And the love that he has shown us. We do this in remembrance because now all our sins have been washed away for those that are child followers. Let me just, I mean, Christ followers. So let me just tell you this. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, my prayer is that you'll find out and you'll realize what all he's done for you and how much he loves you. He's already paid the ultimate price to give his life. But now it's up to you to receive him and believe that he did all that. You know, when somebody, when, when somebody gives their life willingly for something they did not do, that's in a love that is just so amazing. So now we have... We remember what he's done for us on the cross when he gave his body, when he shed his blood. We don't gather to call the gods down anymore. We don't gather to call God down anymore. No, God's already came down. Amen? He's already came down and given us forgiveness of our sin and, and, and that. So now we remember. Next thing about Christian worship is this. We celebrate. As Cotton hit on that some last week, we celebrate. It is a celebration. When we corporately come to worship here at church, it's a, man, it's a time of emotions. It's a time that we, we, really, we really realize what he's done for us. And all the songs that's been written through the years, whether it's been hymns or the more contemporary songs now, the songs have all been written by people pointing about what Jesus has done for us and what we have in our relationship with him. And so when we come to church, man, we should worship from the heart. And it should be a time that we just you know, pour ourselves out. And if, if somebody predicts their death and their resurrection, and then it happens, hey, they call the shots, amen? <laughs> they win. If they, if they say, I'm going to die, and then God's going to raise them from the dead, and it happens, yeah, that's a, plan that's, going to, that's a plan that's in place for you and I. So every Sunday, we celebrate, we celebrate. But Christian worship doesn't stop here at church. We're to carry it out wherever we go. We're to celebrate. We're to worship wherever we go. Worship is from the heart. Worship is we go out and we care about the one that died for us and gave his life for us so that we can have our sins forgiven. And now his, our, his, he wants us to be obedient to him because he wants us to be the hands and feet. He's got a plan. The Apostle Paul wrote this, and he said this in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. He says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, your living bodies, your decisions, your money, your time, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So what is worship for us now in the Christian worship realm? It's our bodies are to be a living sacrifice of praise and worthiness to the one who gave his life for us. Our body is to be a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. We're to offer ourselves. And that leads us into the third one, the last one, is submit. We're to remember. When we take communion, we remember what he's done for us. We celebrate what he's done for us. But then we submit because we are to be a living sacrifice, holy before him and pleasing unto him. And we get ready to take communion here in just a second. We're to think about this whole thing. Communion has all three of these. And here's the last statement I'll read. We remember and celebrate what Christ did for us and submit to what his love for us requires of us. We remember, we celebrate, and then we submit. Now we're gonna, I'm going to do an invitation right here and give you a challenge. Now's the time to do business with God. Because this is, this is the thing. Sometimes in our worship, we get off track. We take for granted 
we lose focus. We lose our fire. We get caught up in the things of this world. And this is to remind us, hey, what he did for us was huge. And we should never forget that. On a daily basis, we hold it dear to us and we worship him. But we celebrate. Hey, we can celebrate today. Our sins have been forgiven. He's won. Satan is, is going to be defeated. He's already defeated, but one day he's going to be finally gone. And we can live with that every day. It's something to be thankful for and to worship and to celebrate. But here comes the hard part for a lot of people is to submit. To really submit to him. Our bodies is a living sacrifice. Because we live selfish lives. We want what we want. Oh yeah, God's good, but you know, I think this is better. And we live for ourselves and we don't submit to God. You and I both, every day of our lives, we've got to submit to him. And say, God, not my will, but your will be done. You are the Lamb of God. You are worthy. You gave your life. And I'm submitting. I don't know how this rests with you. We're going to take communion. It, it, you don't have to take communion. If you're new to church and you know, you don't, you've never come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you, know, you, you don't have to take it. And we're not going to look at you strange if you don't. So, But I will say this. I think that before we take communion, we need to make sure that we are right before him. If we're going to remember and be thankful for what he's done for us, if God brings anything to your attention that you need to get straight, you need to do it before you take communion. I think it's that serious because what he did for us was a huge price. It was huge. In the beginning, there was pagan gods. Supposedly, it was all these different gods. But even when that nation of Israel, they had a big responsibility. But they stayed on the plan, eventually got to where they needed to be, and and then the, the Lamb of God prevailed and finished it up for Christian worship. So I challenge you to pray before God. And, and we're going to take communion here in a moment. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. But a young lady to accept Christ in the first service. You know, you just don't know who's searching and who's looking around. But I will say one thing. I will say one thing. If you don't know Christ, you've got no hope at all. I'm not here to be ugly to you. He's laid the plan out. He'd give his life. And now it's up to you to choose him. The thing is, is when you choose him, he wipes away all your sins. Isn't that something? Wipes them all away. Never our, our past, our present, and our future sins. Why would he do that? Because he loves you and he's got a plan for you. But when you choose him, you're, you're welcomed into the family of God. You're a child of God. Nobody can ever take that away from you. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you're watching behind a computer screen and God's got your attention. Man, I pray you just respond and let God into your life. Father, we love you and I thank you so much for, for what you're doing now and stirring our hearts. Lord, this matter of worship, you are worthy. We should be a living sacrifice. That We're willing to be the hands and feet of whatever you want us to do, to love on people in a way that you loved on them to care about people the way you cared about them. To not be selfish with our own lives, but no, Lord, be mindful of what you want to do in and through our lives so that we can see life change around us happen and people that are far and in the dark that don't know you as Lord and Savior and are searching, they can find you through our lives because it reflects you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one's looking around. Maybe you're here and you just need to do business with the Lord. Now's the time you just pray and get things right before God. But if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, what are you waiting on? Nobody's looking around. Everybody's just praying or your head's down. If you're not really praying about anything, pray for somebody. Just pray for God to move. But if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you're saying, well, what, what am I supposed to do? What do I need to do? You need to do what the Bible says and call out to it. Believe that He did die for you and that God did raise him from the dead just like he said it would happen it happened hundred people over a hundred people saw him alive after he'd been crucified it's a lot of witnesses saw him alive he met with them like seven times he's alive and well and if you'll ask him to forgive you of your sin 
The Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin and make you right with God again. He washes them all away and you can become a new creation. You say, well, I don't, I got to get my life together. No, you don't. You get Jesus in your life and he'll help you get it together. That's the way it works. You just come to him as you are and, and you follow him and you watch him transform your life. And it's a decision you will never regret. You'll never regret it. You say, well, what must I do? I'm, I'm going to pray a prayer. It's not some magic prayer. I'm just going to call out to God. You pray something like this and ask him to forgive you. It's a heart condition. Maybe there's somebody here right now. You need Jesus in your life. And the Holy Spirit is tugging on you. You feel like I'm talking to you. And I have no idea who you are. But your heart's probably beating fast. And you know that this is what you're supposed to do. Just call out to him. Say, dear Jesus, I need you. I've always known there's, there's a God out there, but I believe through your word, I believe that your son Jesus died for me. And Jesus, right now, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I choose to follow you. I'm yours. I realize I won't be perfect, but Lord, I want to be your, your servant. I want to be a living sacrifice to bring honor to you. If you prayed something like that and called out to him, guess what? The Bible says that he washed all your sins away. He knew you were going to be here. He knew you were going to be on the broadcast or, the, or behind a computer screen watching. He knew that. And you had to respond, and you did. And that's the greatest decision. That was your next step. And now, the Bible says that as soon as you do that, the Bible says that God sends the Holy Spirit to you to live inside of you, to help you, to show you, to guide you, to lead you. That's the gift that he gives to you is the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You're now the temple that his Holy Spirit dwells in. And now you're his, his child and nobody can take that away. Now you just follow him. If you made that decision to follow Christ today, I'd love to hear from you. I've got a book for, for you. It's called Next Steps. Because you're probably thinking, what do I do next? What are my next steps? It's just kind of a little booklet that helps you to, to, to start growing as a Christian. We're here to help you and support you any way that we can. But heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want to do this. If you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior today, and I believe there's somebody in here, if you're in this building and you receive Christ and you meant it, and you just invite Him into your life, I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out. We want to rejoice with you. We want to celebrate. I want you to slip your hand up right now. Just lift it up real high. Thank you for that one back there. Somebody else. Thank you for that one back there. Somebody else. Yes, praise the Lord. Anybody else? We just want to rejoice with you, man. Only God can do that. And we celebrate with you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Please come see me and get you a book. I'd love to give it to you. If you've got any questions, I'd love to talk with you, man. We're just so happy for you. We've, so many of us have experienced that now. We're so happy that you've experienced it. Here in just a moment, we're going to take communion together. And when they pass this, this out... I want you to just hold on to it until I come back and give you further instruction. They'll pass it out here in just a moment. You just hang on to it. Father, we love you and thank you for decisions made here today. Thank you for these that have come to know you in a personal way. Lord, it was designed that they be here. They were here. And now, Lord, they're a child of God by their confession to you that inviting you into their life. And Lord, I, I thank you again as we get ready to take communion here in just a few moments. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. We can't ever repay you because what you did was so huge. May we always remember that. May we always celebrate that. And may we always submit to what you've done by being obedient and being a living sacrifice. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, as they pass the, the elements now, and again, hang on to it until, the, until I come back and I'll give you further instruction. It's amazing how this, think about it, this ordinance takes us back to the Passover meal where, you know, which took place um, you know, right before Jesus was crucified and, and uh, resurrected you know, there on the, on the cross. But um, it takes us all the way back. And uh, so we do this in remembrance of him. But let me read this scripture. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, From now on, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, after supper, 
he took the cup and saying, this cup is a new covenant. This cup represents the end of one and the beginning of the new covenant. In my blood, whoever you drink, whoever, whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And not only are we to do that here, but like I said before, we are to take it out there. Remember him in our daily thoughts and our daily decisions because that's what he wants us to be as a living sacrifice. Let's all stand up. We're going to have one more song of worship.